Young people can be dismissed at this time for the children's church in the back. And the rest of us turn to Luke chapter 20, if you would, thank you. Luke chapter 20. <coughs> Love to see a great group of young people and, and appreciate those that are here uh, for us with us today. Luke chapter 20. I recently saw a list of dumb warning labels. I don't know if you've ever seen any of these. I, I sold uh, auto parts for years and on one of uh, our brands of, uh, of, fan, of, um, of fan belts, uh, the serpentine fan belts, it said not to change it while the engine's running. So there's sometimes you have to put those type of warning labels on. There's a tag on Rowenta's irons. It says, warning, never iron clothes while wearing them. Nabisco Easy Spread Cheese announces on its label, for best results, move, remove cap. I wonder who it was. That, well, anyway. The label on Little One's Baby Lotion. Little One's Baby Lotion. Keep product away from children. I don't know how you're supposed to work it, but on some brands of jet skis, uh, never use a lit match to check fuel level. Or video it if you do. I don't think that's in there either, but that's one I'd add. W.H. Collins Vanishing Fabric Markers. This marker is not to be used to sign checks. <laughs> that would, especially not when it's written to Bible Baptist Church, amen? We don't want you to sign them with a... Vanishing fabric marker. Apple's iPod shuffle do not eat. Warning label on a wheelbarrow not intended for highway use. Warning label on a baby stroller remove child before folding. There's a lot of these different warning labels that we have to help us. But did you know that God's word is full of warnings as well? Look at a parable today. And a uh, parable, by the way, is simply a, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. That's one of my favorite uh, descriptions or definitions of the word parable. And today's parable will help us take a good look at our lives from God's point of view. That's what parables do. Help us to see that truth uh, in a way that we can understand. We live in an age that's been called the age of psychology because never before in history has a society looked at life so much as we do today in terms of internal emotional dynamics. It's interesting, though, the Bible says much about our behavior and how it's best understood in terms of deep spiritual repression. The Bible says you repress some things in your life. Underneath your self-deprecation, underneath your cold-heartedness, underneath your anger toward other people, the one thing uh, that is really repressed is an enmity, an animosity, yes, even a hatred for God himself. The Bible says that the nature of the human heart is that not just that we're indifferent to God, not just that you don't like God, not uh, just that you have a, uh, an apathy toward Him, but intrinsic in every human heart is an active resentment of God. And I want to get to that in a little bit as we work through our parable. As a result, obviously, this affects every area of our life. And that's actually what I believe this parable is about. Let's start reading verse number 9 of Luke chapter 20. Then began he to speak to the people this parable. A certain man planted a vineyard and led it forth to husbandmen and went on a far country for a long time. And at the season he sent a servant to the husbandmen that they should give him of the fruit of the vineyard, but the husbandmen beat him and sent him away empty. And again he sent another servant, and they beat him also, and entreated him shamefully, and sent him away empty. And again he sent a third, and they wounded him also, and cast him out. Then said the Lord of the vineyard, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. It may be that they will reverence him when they see him. But when the husbandmen saw him, they reasoned among themselves, saying, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him. The inheritance may be ours. So they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. What therefore shall the Lord of the vineyard do unto them? He shall come and destroy these husbandmen, and he shall give the vineyard to others. And when they heard it, they said, God forbid. I want to preach today on a few, for a few moments here on an owner or a tenant. An owner or a tenant. Father, we pray you'd help us in these few minutes we have together. Help your word to be clear and myself removed from it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to look at the three key relationships in this parable. Each one of them teaches something about, uh, well, us and how we react to God as well. 
the owner of the vineyard here left it in the hands of some tenants. And I want to look first at the relationship, the tenant's relationship to the owner. What the, the, It's an obvious relationship. It's pretty clear from the parable. In fact, a lot of times you look at these parables, you have to do a lot of culture gap explanation. Not really here. We understand this pretty clearly. He owns a vineyard. He hires people to work in it. And they have to tend that vineyard for him. See, a man bought a vineyard. He invested in the vineyard. And he planted it. So he goes on a journey. He leaves this group of tenant farmers to tend it. What is the responsibility then, or the relationship of the tenants to the owner? It's pretty much self-evident. It is the owner's risk, it is the owner's investment, it was the owner's money. So the tenants have their pay, but they have to tend the garden in a particular way. They don't make the choices and the decisions, that is up to the farmer, the vineyard owner. So he is, as he is the owner, they have to tend it by his word and for his profit. By his word means they can't tend it any old way they want to. It's not their garden. It's his garden. And so they are probably instructed. They find out what his policies are. They find out how he wants to do it. And they have to tend it by his word. Secondly, they have to tend it for his profit. Now, of course, he would be paying them a fair wage. And they get their pay. But he gets the profit. Don't forget, it's his vineyard. It's not their vineyard. It's his vineyard. And so they he would get... The prof- this is obvious, and we understand this even today. If you put the money up, if you put the investment down, if you pay someone to work in your vineyard or your grocery store or your gas station or your farm or whatever it is, you pay somebody to work that or whatever, the profits and the deficits belong to the owner. That makes sense? We all understand that even today. Now, who's Jesus talking to? Verse 1, if you go back, you'll see that he's talking to the religious leaders of uh, Israel, among other people, but they are, I believe, the main target of his conversation here. Now, if you go back to Isaiah chapter 5, Jeremiah chapter 2, if you go to Psalm chapter 80, and many other places, you'll find where Israel is referred to as a vineyard. God gave them this vineyard. He gave Israel many things. Their homeland, the law. He gave them his word. He gave them the temple. This was their vineyard. Vineyard. They were given these things, and the religious leaders were seen as tenants. It was their job as the leaders of Israel to govern Israel by, don't miss it, God's word. Not just the way they thought was best, not by their traditions and not by their own wisdom, but by God's word. Then they were supposed to tend this Israel as their vineyard by God's, for God's profit, or you could say God's glory. Uh, not for their own power, not for their own expansion, but for the glory of God. So the first people that this parable is aimed at, or you might say the primary people, I believe, is the religious leaders of Israel. But the broader point is critical for us to see, and that's what I like to do when I look at a parable. I understand, for instance, like the prodigal son parable was given to the Pharisees, and they pictured the older son. You know the prodigal son parable is not about the younger son, it's about the older son. The younger son was in there, but uh, really it's more making a point about the older son. But yet you can, you and I can look at that and we can learn things from it. We can look at this and learn things from it as well. Look at your life today. Look at what it consists of. You have your life. You have gifts. You have talent. You have ability. You have certain amount of privileges of some kind that you probably got from your parents or your upbringing. You've been given all sorts of things. You must recognize, friend, that you are a steward of what you have been given. You have to look at your life and your possessions and your talents and your intelligence and all those different things. You have to look at them, or you must not look at them in your life, I'm sorry, as if you are the owner of those things. Uh, you must look at your life as if you are a tenant. Now, I'm going to make a statement. It's a very simple statement. But it's also very profound, and I'd like for you to mark this down in the the notebook of your memory, if you will. You only own what cannot be taken away. You, friend, and I only own what cannot be taken away. We say, I have wealth. Your wealth can be taken away. You you read uh, just not so long ago in the 
in the 1930s, the Great Depression, and I marvel at some of the vast wealth that some men had and lost it all in a day. You say, well, I have my children. Your children can be taken away from them, God forbid, but our children can get sick. They can die. They can be taken away from us. Uh, you, you really don't have anything material in your life or it's something that you can touch. You really don't have anything that can't be taken away. Your health, it can be taken away. Everything we have, it can be removed. Therefore, we can't act really as if we are owners of it. In our text today, the primary problem is that you have a bunch of tenants who are starting to act like owners. There's a bad thing for them to happen. I believe that's the point of the parable. They will not listen to the messengers. They will not manage by the owner's words. When they show up to get the owner's profit, they won't even give that messenger the owner's profit. Now, we know, again, primary picture was the religious leaders. The religious leaders would not listen to God's word. Jesus said in Matthew 23, 2, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not do. They did what they did to further their own interest. The Bible says also, Jesus said in Matthew 15, 6, to the Pharisees, you have made the commandment of God to none effect by your tradition. So they had lowered the word of God and raised their own tradition. What they wanted trumped what God wanted. But let's bring it back to where we are. Again, bring the parable back to us. It is the nature of the human heart to think of itself as the owner of what it has. Say that again. It is the nature of our heart to consider ourselves the owner of what we have, or what has been given to us. Uh, we're tenants, if you will, acting like owners. For example, look at your life again. You have a mind. You can't just do with your mind whatever you want to do with it. You can't just believe anything you want. You have desires, be they material, be they sexual, be they, uh, whether it be money or whatever it is, you can't just use your desires in any way you want. You have a certain amount of power. You cannot abuse that power. You have a certain amount of money. You can't just use that money in any which way you want. Now, what does the world teach us? It obviously teaches us the exact opposite. The world tells us you decide your own values. You have to set the agenda. In other words, the world says... Act like an owner. It's yours. You're the one that deserves. The Bible says in Proverbs 14, 12, there's a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. What the Bible says is, hey, you're, uh, you're, the Bible tells us clearly that we are tenants. Another word the Bible uses is stewards. We are stewards. That's all we are. Tenants. There are all sorts of ways you can act like an owner instead of a tenant. You can just say, I'm going to, decide how I use my mind. I'm going to decide how I fulfill my desires. I'm going to decide how I use my money. And what the Bible says you have to do uh, is tend to the vineyard by His word and for His profit, or again, His glory. That's what we are, how we ought to live and for what. Acting like an owner is evidenced in yet another way. There's a fierce impulse in our heart to want to believe that if you're successful, it's because of your effort. If you are achieve fame, it's because of your talent. If you are wealthy, it is because of your superiority. A tenant acting like an owner. You know what all that leads to ultimately? That if you go to heaven, it's because of your goodness. See, that's where the devil, that's the ultimate lie the devil wants to sell you. That you can get to heaven because of your good works, because of your life, because you are a good person, when the Bible is very clear saying, there is none that seeketh after God. There is none righteous. No, not one. We better recognize that. And so we, uh, for sure, certainly we can't get to heaven on our own. That's the ultimate conclusion of the devil's deception. You, you even see this desire for ownership in your children. I don't need help. I can do it myself. Child ever said that to you? A few weeks ago, maybe months ago, my 11-year-old son, Mike, is here at church with me, and uh, I needed the bus moved. And I said, Mike, if I give you the keys, will you move, pull the bus around? Oh, yeah, yeah. 
thinking they can do. And by the way, you say, that's just children. No, it's adults too. Uh, that, that's how we think too. We live in the illusion of self-sufficiency and independence. Whereas our real condition, if we're going to be honest with ourselves, is dependence and hopefulness that nothing bad will happen. We don't want to admit our helplessness. We delude ourselves into thinking that our human resources can supply our heart's desires. Can I remind you about our human condition? None of us have anything to do with our being born. Did you have anything to do with you being born? It just it came upon you. You had nothing to do with it. We have no control over whether we are male or female. I understand some claim that you can control those things today. You cannot. You're born one way or you're born the other. You don't control that no matter how much you claim you do. Isn't it amazing that you can be one thing and just claim to be another thing and we're all supposed to accept it? I wish it applied to other things. If you're overweight, can you identify as a skinny person? Does that make you trans-slender? Huh? Hey! Give you one to work with there. You have no anything to do with your birth. Whether you're born Japanese or Russian or American, white, yellow, or black, you have no choice in the matter. After you're born, an automatic nervous system starts to control your vital functions that sustain life. A power that no one really understands keeps your heart beating, your lungs breathing, your blood circulating, and your temperature at 98.6 degrees. A surgeon can cut tissues, but can do nothing to force the body to heal. We grow old relentlessly and automatically. Self-sufficient? Not hardly. We are not self-sufficient. And in the middle of all this, is really, we can be young and we can be healthy. And I don't want to be morbid today. I know you didn't come to hear bad news, but, uh, but, but you know and I know, friend, that life can end just like that. We hear about it all the time. We're not self-sufficient. We are tenants. We're not owners. Jesus uh, made a comment on this in John 15, 5, a verse that I don't really like when I read it, but this Jesus said it, and it's true. I am the vine, you're the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do, you know the next word? Nothing. 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 We're helpless. Now the Bible says that at the core of our nature, again, stay with me because you're going, this might seem, I never heard that before, but I'm going to show you from the Bible in a moment here. On the one hand, we know we're tenants. On the other hand, we hate it. On the one hand, we know that uh, we are not, or that we owe the owner, but we don't want to owe the owner. We want to do it ourselves, and we want to take credit for it. We don't want to admit that all this is a gift. We don't want to admit what James 1.17 tells us, that every good gift and perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights. We don't want the illusion of independence and self-sufficiency to be shattered by anybody. And anyone who tells us otherwise, we get angry at them. We beat them, messengers that come. This is where atheism and humanism take root. We hate the idea of a God who will not let us be in control. I want to be an owner. I want to be in control of my own life and my destiny. So we want nothing to shatter that illusion. No matter how messed up we are, no matter how crazy our life is, we, want to, we don't want that bubble that says we're in control of our destiny. I'm in control of all this. We don't want that bubble to be burst. The first relationship tells us how, or that we know we have an obligation to the owner, but we hate it. We saw that with these tenants. And then we have the tenants' relationship to the messengers. God sent messengers, and they beat them. Now, it tells us several things here. One, one of which is, I think, the primary application you take from here is that that uh, God sends more than one. I love that. But the primary application here, God sent prophet to Israel over year, over the years. For, for uh, hundreds of years, God had sent prophets to Israel uh, to tell them they're not tending the vineyard the way that God had told them to do. 
by God's word and for his prophet, that they're tending it by their own wisdom, and their own tradition, for their own glory and their own power. He sent them prophets over the years. And you know what they did? They beat them. Read the book of Jeremiah. You'll see that they literally beat the prophets. They killed them. All through history, friend, men who have spoken the truth, men who have proclaimed the word of God, have been despised and rejected by the world around them. It is a waste of time for preachers to seek the approval of a lost world. Consequently, it's concerning to me when I see a preacher who has the love and adoration of a lost world around them. When in history ever have you seen a nation's prophets and preachers that have been loved and adored? In Old Testament, Ahab and Jezebel tried to kill Elijah just for preaching the truth. In the New Testament, John the Baptist lost his head because he preached the word of God. Now, we could go on and on and on, example after example, but the messengers of God, if they preach the truth, are rarely admired. Now, what does this mean for us? This parable reminds us that God, in his mercy, gives us more than one chance. I love the fact that he sent a messenger. They beat that messenger and sent him back. He sends another messenger. They beat him even worse and sent him back. And what does he do? He sends him another messenger still. What a blessing. He sends repeated messengers into our lives to tell us what? Well, to remind us we're not the owners. To shatter the illusion that we're self-sufficient. To show us our true condition is dependence. Now, how does he do that? Well, there's lots of ways. Uh, we can. I'll look at just a few here, but maybe it was your parents that got the truth to you and And maybe you've forsaken the truth of your parents and you didn't literally physically beat them, but you've turned your back on their teaching and discarded all their investment. Only a parent parent can know the pain and despair of a prodigal child. Maybe it was a pastor. Again, you may not have physically beaten him, but you show contempt in not doing what he says you should do. There was a visiting preacher who had just finished his sermon and went to the back to shake hands and And uh, after shaking a few hands, a seven-year-old son of one of the deacons came. It's always scary when a child of a deacon comes and shakes your hand. So he came up and shook his hand and said, Well, good morning, young man. reached out to shake his hand. And when he did so, he felt something in the palm of his hand. He looks down, there's a dollar there. He said, What's this? The boy said, It's for you. He said, Well, son, I I don't need your money. I I don't want you to give me your money. And what are you doing this for? Why are you giving me money for? And the boy replied, I just want you to have it because you see my daddy, the deacon, my daddy said, you're the poorest preacher we've ever had and I just want to help you. Now there are poor preachers everywhere, but thank God for those that will faithfully deliver the message. And I ask you, what are you doing to the messenger? How are you treating the messenger? One, uh, one person put it this way, the test of a preacher is that his congregation goes away saying, not what a lovely sermon, but... I will do something. And that's the goal and the desire of every preacher of the Word of God that it produces action in the people of God. Therefore, they resound at the message. How do you respond to the messenger? Maybe it was a parent. Maybe it was a pastor. For some, the messengers have been pals. I would have said friends, but I want to impress Pastor Forsberg with my alliteration. So, uh, for some, it was pals. Trying to get the truth to you. And you disregarded it. And then there's another one. Providential. Messengers is what I like to call providential messengers. A providential messenger is a tragedy, a frustration, a disappointment, an unfilled longing. And often God uses those things to demonstrate to us we're not really in control. You ever had a serious sickness? A family member with a serious sickness? Lost a loved one? Had some other tragedy come into your life? to remind you, you're a tenant. You're not the owner. You're a tenant. You're not in control. God uses trials for that. My, uh, the greatest battle, friend, that's waged for the glory of God is not the one around me, but the one in me. We are constantly trying to take that glory that belongs to Him and put it upon ourselves because my sinful heart does not want to relinquish control. And trials are God's tool to break that confidence in myself and remind me that I really am not the owner. 
I am only a tenant here. Trials and weaknesses keep me from embezzling God's glory from Him. They are sent into your life for the very purpose of telling you you're not in control of your life. You're a tenant. Don't act like an owner. Life will never let you, in the end, believe you're an owner. I really believe that. At the end of Queen Elizabeth's life, as her life ebbed away, she made these words, her last words, all my possessions for a moment of time. She found out that she might have been a monarch, but she was really only a tenant. Frank Sinatra, who sang, I did it my way, died after saying, I'm losing it. Life will never let you act as an owner, no matter how hard you try to control it, no matter how much you demand, I'm going to do it my way, it will not work. You will get beat up. Tragedy will strike you that you cannot control because, friend, you're not an owner. You're a tenant. Let us not forget it. Now, if life proves to you that you're not the owner, then we have to suppose from that logical conclusion that there is another person that is the owner. Why not just surrender to him? Say, Lord, you're in control anyway. Look, God's in control whether or not we relinquish it. Amen? Let's just give him the glory and tell him he's in control. Life is a messenger constantly coming at you saying, you're not in control. You're not in charge. You are the tenant. These things are all gifts. They are not yours. You're a steward. And life teaches us that through tragedies, trials, and these other areas, these other messengers that God sends us. When you try to get into the driver's seat, you're like an eight-year-old that gets in the car saying, I, I want to drive today. You can't even see over the dashboard, friend. You let somebody control that knows what's going on. Jesus is saying in His mercy here, I'm not just giving you one chance. I'm going to keep sending my messengers. Are you listening to them today, friend? Maybe God's coming to you today and He's simply saying, hey, would you let me, or would you give me the steering wheel back? I got a picture I want to show you uh, that uh, He's going to throw up there. I thought this was interesting. Life is often like this guy. Top of his world! Finally got a picture that He's wanted to get. Boy, he's going to have a ma full-on magazine spread, not realizing he's not the owner of those woods. Amen? About to wake up. I just thought, I got a chuckle out of that when I saw it, because he seems so happy that he's able to get a picture of those two little gorgeous cubs, not knowing that uh, somebody else might not be so happy. How are you treating his messengers today, friend? How are you treating them? Are you listening to them? Or are you beating them up? And then finally, look at the tenant's relationship to the son. If you read this text carefully, as you'll see that as time goes on, every messenger who comes is treated worse than the one before. Their hostility is growing the more messengers that they get. Now, I really believe that under all of our complaining, under all of our unhappiness and our self-pity, there's anger and resentment at the idea that we're not in charge. Like a child, I know what's best for me, and somebody will not let me be in charge. Anger, resentment. What does the Bible have to say about this? Now, it might surprise you, but the Bible is very clear that it is natural to the human heart to hate God, as I mentioned in the beginning of this message. Let me give you a couple of verses here. Well, by the way, first, first let's just offer some evidence. We have evidence for it. The very first time... In fact, the only one time in the history of the world that God made Himself physically vulnerable, He was hated, He was falsely accused, He was whipped, and He was tortured, and He was killed. The Bible says, or Jesus said in John 15, 25, they hated me without a cause. Paul said in Romans 8, 7, because the carnal man, that is the another word for the natural man, uh, the carnal man mind is enmity against God. Notice, friend, it doesn't say it has enmity towards God. It is enmity towards God. A natural mind is at the core of who you are and who I am. We want to control our life. It's a constant battle, isn't it? We want to control our life. And, and God wants to control your life. By the way, your life is much better if God's in control. Amen? If you get the steering wheel, you're just going to make a mess out of it. That's what happens. Let God have it. It's like the 
squeaky-voiced teenager with zero sense and zero experience. It's my life. I want to live life my way. We as adults look at that and understand how ridiculous it is, and yet it's bred into us. It's who we are. It's just as ridiculous for an adult to not shake their fist at God, but look toward heaven. God, this is my life. I want to live it this way. We better remember, friend, we are tenants. We are not owners. Let us not act like owners. Now we come to the saddest part of the parable. The Lord of the vineyard says, what am I going to do? Keep sending messengers, they keep beating them. I know what I'll do. I'll send my son. I'm sure that when they see my son, they'll recognize who he is and they'll recognize that uh, his importance and they'll have respect for him. They'll realize that that, uh, he loves them and surely... They'll recognize my goodwill when I send my own son. When the son shows up, he's killed instantly out of enmity. But the glory of the gospel, and obviously you you can see the picture of God sending messengers, preachers, prophets, and and, uh, parents, and and, uh, providential teachers, and all these things into your life. He's trying to get you to see these things. He sends all these messengers and finally he sends his son. You understand the picture. Jesus Christ came into this world. God sent his son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And the glory of the gospel is that the very killing that comes from the enmity is the very way in which God slays the enmity. There's a fascinating verse in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 16. If you want to go there, if not, I'll read it in a moment here. But Ephesians 2, 16, it says that on the cross, even though we were sinners, even though we were mad at God, even though there was a barrier between us, God slew the enmity. The Bible says here in verse 16, and he, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity, enmity thereby. It says that on the cross... He slew the enmity. But wait a minute. If you'll look up at the cross, will you notice who's up there? Who's on that cross? Jesus Christ is on that cross. He is the one that's being destroyed. And this is the point. Look at the lengths that God will go to to reconcile us. Though he, we were His enemies, and we won't even admit it, He made Jesus the enmity. How? He made Jesus sin who knew no sin. He treated Jesus as the enemies that we are, so he could treat us as friends that we don't deserve. Isn't that a blessing? Uh, he, he gave, uh, Jesus went in our place. Now, God can come in his Holy Spirit and he can open our eyes and show us that we have that enmity naturally. Listen, friend, it is absolutely natural, humanly speaking, for you to want to control your life, for you to want to control your destiny. We want to hang on. It's not natural to tithe and give. It's not natural for us to give of ourselves and help other people at at our own expense for for nothing in return. Those aren't natural. Those are supernatural. Uh, Those are the changes that God makes in us. So he could come and show us our enmity. Jesus Christ was willing to die for you. He was willing to become an enemy and to be treated like an enemy for you. Now, can I ask you, friend, how can it be dangerous to give control of your life to someone that loved you that much. It's not. Not dangerous at all. We have already proven you're not in control anyway. (laughs) And so, uh, he became enmity for you. He was slain on the cross so that instead of enemies, we could be his friends. Now, I ask you today, friend, in light of these things we've discussed, are you living life as an owner That means that you make the demand to live any way you please. You use the gifts that God has given you only for personal benefit. You demand your own way because after all, it's your life. Owner. Or do you recognize that you're a tenant? Accepting that all you have is a gift from God. Everything that we have cometh from the Father of lights above. Your children, your family... Your possessions, these are things for you to steward. Can I tell it, remind you again, you only own what you cannot lose. And we can lose everything we have here. 
And so we need to be the steward of them. Your daily choices, if you're living as a tenant, reflect living by the directives of the owner. You recognize, hey, this isn't mine, and so I need to honor those whose it is his. I have to remember that with my children. These aren't my children. They're God's children that he let me steward for a while. This church isn't my church. It's not your church. We're, allowed, we're able to be here, and God gave us these things to steward once in a while. Your bank account, that's not really yours. It's only yours if you can't lose it. And friend, I've got news. You can lose it. You can. A lot of ways it happens this day and age. We need to remember God gave us those things. You need to be tenants, not owners. When you begin to be an owner in your life, the, the, the whole shift takes place in the way we really do everything, in the way that we honor God, in the way that we make our own personal demands. I just encourage you today, friends, it's a whole lot easier to recognize we're tenants. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they lived in tents. And other, they were wealthy men but they lived in tents. Hebrews chapter 11 says that they, uh, the reason they lived in tents, one of the reasons is because they had their eye on a city, not built with human hands, built by God. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they recognized that they were only passing through. That's when Abraham wrote that song. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. I don't know if Abraham wrote it, but he certainly, certainly lived it, amen. And so, but you've heard that song. And that's how they live. And really, when you read the story of, of all those men, Abraham, Isaac, there's Jacob, and, and that, those that, that uh, we call them the patriarchs. When you read about the patriarchs, there is really only one tragedy in the midst of all that, and that was for the one man who gave up his tent for a house. His name was Lot. Remember him? When Lot realized, or he started to think, I'm not a tenant here, I'm an owner. I'm not just passing through. This is where I want to live. And he put down roots and he bought a I'm not saying you shouldn't buy a house. I'm just using this as an example. He had a lot of trouble. We ought to live our lives recognizing we are just passing through. We are tenants. Everything that you have is a gift from God. Everything that, you, uh, that, that God has allowed you to enjoy, and these things are good, physical, uh, material possessions, nothing wrong with any of that, as long as we give them the proper place. Money, nothing, if you're wealthy, praise God for you, I'm, I'm grateful, there's nothing wrong with that at all, as long as you give it the proper place. I'm just simply saying, don't live as an owner, because God, life, it'll soon show you, you're not an owner, you're a tenant. Much better to just relinquish this than it is to have it taken from you. Amen? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Are you living life as a tenant, or are you living life